Welcome to this edition of the Critics' Choice Association's In the Conversation. I'm Sean Edwards, and I am delighted to be here with the director of The Color Purple, Blitz, Baza Wule. How are you doing, sir? Fantastic. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, thanks for joining us for this edition of In the Conversation, where we sit down and talk to the filmmakers and the people responsible for some of the biggest movies of the year. And I want to talk to you about The Color Purple most definitely. Before we jump in and talk about what you had to do in terms of directing this film, can we please give a shout out to the entire filmmaking team? Because the craftsmanship in this movie is outrageous. I'm talking about the art direction, the set design, the costuming, the sound mixing, the everything. And I'm intentionally saving the cinematography for last because this was some of the best cinematography I've ever seen. I've seen like a million films. The mm. cinematography in this film is flat out amazing. I've never seen people of color look the way they look in this film. So can you please shout out the DP? Wow, man. First of all, thank you so much, Sean. It's a pleasure, pleasure to be here. Um, man, I was blessed to have such an incredible team. I mean, you, you shouted some of, the, some of the departments out, but I'll start with Dan Lawson. Because Dan, for me, you know, we had these conversations. We, we were like, look, we're going to be photographing, you know, uh, 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 you know, a moment in time, right? And, and for us, it was going to be about how do you capture black skin? How do you light it? How do we push past some of the flat lighting that we've seen in the past? And how do we how do we really create these beautiful images, right? And, and, and of course, having the incredible Francine Jameson Tunchuk, who, by the way, was Steven Spielberg's assistant costumer in the 1985 film. So it was a full circle for her coming in and working with me on The Color Purple as my head. Uh, uh, costumer, uh, Fr Francine was incredible. And of course, Paul Astebury, uh, who won the Academy Award for uh, Shape of Water, um, was my production designer. Uh, he was incredible at, at helping me create uh, uh, these worlds. And we always talked about how do you make sure that these worlds are lived in? How do you make sure that these worlds are not, you don't feel like you're on a stage. They, they feel like you literally were dropped into the world itself. And then, of course, you notice the incredible Fatima Robinson, who was my choreographer. And that movement, I must say, Sean, was part of how Dan's work makes sense. It's because when you have this level of, of craftsmanship on the movement, you end up with truly some of the most incredible lighting and lighting choices because of how brilliant Fatima's work was. And also, let's not forget the camera movement itself. Between Fatima and Dan, there was a constant choreography around camera and movement. It wasn't also just in the musical numbers. It was also in narrative work and asking ourselves, how do we move characters through the frame so you're never just doing reverse shot, reverse shot. You are figuring out interesting ways in which the big dance scenes, which are always going to be hyper choreographed camera and, and, and characters, also align with your choreography around narrative and scene work. And would you say because as, as a director of this film, you were functioning not so much as a director-director as we usually see directors work, but this is special material. I mean, it's based on the Pulitzer Prize winning novel. Then you had the 1985 film, and then you had the musical. I mean, what best prepared you to handle this material to deliver the film in the manner in which you did? First, I mean, it begins always with Alice Walker's brilliant Pulitzer Prize winning book, you know? I mean, when I first was called um, for this opportunity, um, I went back and I read her book and I felt like that's what gave me the confidence. I mean, her opening lines say, dear God, you know, these are letters being written to God. And I immediately went, oh, well, this character must have an imagination. Because anyone who is writing letters to God must have a deep well up here, right? And I also know that, you know, often people who deal with abuse and trauma often miscategorized as docile or passive. You know, and I think that that's, nothing could be more false. 
I think that people who deal with trauma and abuse are constantly in their minds trying to work their way out of trauma and abuse. And only if we had a glimpse into their headspace, we'll know that. So for me, that's what gave me the confidence once I read Alice Walker's book, reread it. I was like, oh, I see. I see, I see where, what perspective we can come through. And then the rest just made sense. It just was about borrowing from all other iterations. But whenever in doubt, we went back to Alice Walker. What was your biggest hurdle? What was your biggest challenge on the film? Because there's so many elements that you had to pull together to make this work. But what was the one that really made you stop, pause, rethink, and kind of re-strategize to make it happen correctly? Good question. Um, I'll say casting. You know, listen, I believe deeply that casting makes or breaks a film. I believe that if you choose wrong, nothing else can go right. And so I kind of will say that that was probably where I put most of my effort was to actually ask myself who are spiritually right for this role. Now their, their, their names are big, their names who could sell a movie. But I really believe that this film required a spiritual alignment with whoever was gonna play it. Starting of course with my lead Fantasia. Fantasia was somebody who had a deepest well um, of emotion, an experience um, and had dealt with some real life stuff herself. And originally didn't want to do the film, which I could understand because, because it was going to conjure up a lot. And, you know, I had to fly down to North Carolina, I had to show her some previs, let her know the version that we were going to do. And then as soon as she saw it, she was like, Blitz, if this is the version you're going to do, I'm done. And I think that, that that's kind of when I was like, okay, I got a movie. Building a cast around her, I mean, everyone from, you know, Daniel Brooks, the incredible Daniel Brooks, to the incomparable Taraji P. Henson, you know, then, you know, you know, getting Coleman Domingo, a master of craft, you know, getting uh, Halle Bailey, you know, just a, a, a brilliant young woman, new star that's born, um, her, John Batiste the legendary Lou Gossett Jr., um, Anjanou Ellis. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. But I will say that was the real work. And once I landed on that, I got to tell you, man, this work became butter. It became just like showing up every day and watching geniuses work. I mean, I always say I never step in. You know, I, I always, once you choose right, the director's job is to let brilliant mm -hmm. people do their job. You know what I mean? And and if they come to me with a question, I ask them the question. So what would you do? And then a lot of times, actually, in our rehearsals, we rarely, I mean, we read the, you know, the text, but that wasn't really it. A lot of our time was spent talking about our personal lives, our traumas, our challenges, things that we've been through, things that people like us have been through, our uncles, our aunties, our parents. That was what the world was. And once we had that stew, I mean, you could put us anywhere and we'll be fine. No, I'm glad you cited casting because that's such an underappreciated aspect of the filmmaking process. And like you said, it's 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 a it's a make or break process. You know, if if you choose wrong, if you cast wrong, I mean, it can sink an entire project. But if you choose right, in the way in which you have, it can just elevate a project to to brand new heights. So I, I'm I'm really glad you, you talked about that process. And another thing I want to touch on too that really blew me away as I was watching the film is the choice of locations. Where did you guys film, and why did you decide on those locations? Because it's almost like the places you choose to film were an added character. One thousand percent. I always say that you know it, you know location is character. You know, it's the same way you got to cast your cast, you got to cast your locations. You know what I mean? And you got to go, how does this space allow me to bring these brilliant people to function in it? And for me, that was the hardest part of the work as well. Driving all through the rural South in Georgia, figuring out where would be right. And it's not just like, what's the great location? It's also like, what's within the zone? I mean, there were all of these questions that we had to deal with. But I'm most proud of the spaces we found, Jekyll Island, Driftwood Beach, where just the, it of itself was a world. The, um, the swamp, which by the way, was a real swamp, where we had to drain, it takes two months to drain. We drained it, built our juke joint, spent two months to fill it back in. 
you know, I'm a very practical filmmaker. I come from that school of actually making it happen in real life because then your cast show up completely believing that they are in this world. And so we spent a lot of time, Paul Astbury and myself, driving the length and breadth of Georgia, looking for worlds that would actually be a character as well. No, job well done in the location. I mean, it's just so, I mean, everything about this film is just so beautiful and, and so moving and sweeping. I mean, I just love every element of what you did with this. But the one thing I do want to talk about is there's some heavyweight names associated with this project. Steven Spielberg, Oprah Winfrey, Quincy Jones. How much interaction did you have with the three of them? And if you could share one takeaway that they gave you that really stuck with you, that helped you through the production of this film? Well, um, first of all, I mean, what a blessing. I always say I had the three goats, you know? You know, the, the goat of TV, you know, the goat of, of cinema, and the goat of music. It, it doesn't get, you know, I mean, talk about being spoiled um, as, as an artist to have these, these heavyweights and also just their incredible generosity of time and, and 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 really showed up when needed it was it was quite amazing with steven i gotta tell you a story because what steven told me begun way before this film in 2016 i was at ted conference i'd never made a movie before and i was a ted fellow and what they do at the ted fellowship is like they try to you know meet, match you with whoever is in the industry you're trying to get into and I'd seen Steven Spielberg's name. I went and I said, guys, can you set me up with that guy? That's Steven Spielberg. They're like, yeah, mm, not sure we can do that for you, sir. So, you know me, I'm just, I'm a tenacious cat. So I start walking the building. I'm just like, I guarantee you, I'm going to see this man somewhere in this building. While walking, voila, here comes Steven Spielberg. He's going to, there's a, they had this, uh, augmented reality thing that he was going to. I saw him go in, I said, all right, there he goes. I'm gonna wait outside. At some point he's bound to come out. So I waited and then here he comes. I go up to him, I go, hey, Mr. Spielberg, you know, a big fan, you know, I hit him with the, with the whole spiel. And I go, you know, I've never made a film. I intend to go make my first film this year in Ghana. I go, what can you tell me? You know, like, like what's the one thing you can tell me? And he goes, your voice, Blitz, your voice. He says, that's the only reason I'll ever care about anything you'll ever make, your voice. That was it. Never saw this man again. I went to Ghana. I made The Burial of Koja, my very first film. And legitimately, I remember with my DP, uh, Michael Fernandez, every time we set up a shot, I'll ask him, does this feel like my voice? And he'll be like, yep, feels like your voice, Blitz. So fast forward, I get this call, you know, I go through my first meetings with the producer, Scott Sanders passes me to Oprah Winfrey. I tell her my vision for the film and she says, okay, I think you should tell Steven. Wow. So here we are, what, 2016 or 2020, what, four years later. So I get on with Steven and I go, I don't, I don't know if you remember me, but I came up to you and he goes, you were the guy in that suit. I had on, I remember I had on this crazy, you know, it, it was a suit I'd got made in Ghana. I was feeling myself back then. And he remembered my suit. And I said, yeah, man, you know, you told me about my voice and I've never forgotten that, you know? And it was such a full, let's put it, it was such a full circle moment for me. And that has continued throughout. This film, every time we set up a shot, I asked myself, is this my voice? And, you know, Stevens just, has always kind of just been in the zeitgeist for me that way, you know? So, so, so that's been big. Oprah was there with me day in, day out. So for her, she was, I always, she was like the, the spiritual kind of godmother for us, you know? She lived this life, you know, as a woman herself who came out of the South and became this woman, she is seen, you know what I mean? And so, you know, there was no question she couldn't answer for us. You know, and, and Quincy was always there when we had music questions. So, you know, we run all the music by him and he always had great notes for us. So, man, I mean, 
you know, you kind of can't think when you have when you have that, you know, these incredibly generous people who who are uh, there as your guides. Blitz, I love your voice. I love your film even more. The Color Purple, the director, fantastic job. Even more incredible interview. Just want to say thanks for joining the Critics' Choice Associations yeah. in the conversation. Thanks for always wanting to be a filmmaker and delivering your gift and sharing it with the world. Beautiful, 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 man. And I love your spirit and your energy, man. Oh, I can't man. wait. Thank you, brother. Hey, we got it. <laughs> hey, I can't wait to be meeting in person, man. I love you. I just, you need to sell your, you need to sell your energy and your passion. Let's do it. it. <laughs> I love it, man. I love it. It's, oh. No. It's such a pleasure. Congratulations. I was telling everybody, I mean, I had the pleasure of seeing the film. Unfortunately, I was the only person in, in the theater, so I can't wait to see it with an audience. Oh, I'm dying, is, dying to see this thing with an audience, it's man. It's the best experience in, in, a, in a group. I mean, yeah. Thank you so much, Sean. You, Take care. Blew, it's a pleasure. Blew me away, man. Appreciate you. Thank you, everybody. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right.